Hi, and welcome to the 17th installment of The Dad Project. Glad to have you back, and tonight we make our way back to the eternal sunshine of Southern California, where my dad was part of a flight test program that would also test the idiom, lightning never strikes twice. This expression suggests that a very unusual event is not likely to happen again to the same person or in the same place. Through the vagaries of corporate personhood, we will ask this question of the Grumman Aerospace Corporation. The short answer is yes, lightning can strike twice. Tommy Attrich, a Grumman test pilot, would be the first strike. My dad, Pete Purvis, also a Grumman test pilot, would be the second strike. Years apart, but in a fine bit of temporal synchronicity, these two pilots would experience similar outcomes to what should have been straightforward test flights. More on both incidents later, but before we move on, we must listen to Orson Welles recite John Gillespie's High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheels and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept height with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I prod the high, untrusted sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. In Plato's Republic, Plato quips, our need will be the real creator. Over time, that statement would morph into the English proverb, necessity is the mother of invention. But did we really need to fly? Was it necessary? Need to or not, we did. We learned to fly faster, farther, and higher than the birds that inspired us. Icarus's flight for freedom from Crete was an early failure and was a warning to man to avoid overreaching his limits. Nevertheless, we persisted in exceeding our limits, and our early attempts to fly would include balloons and parachutes. Balloons, of course, ascend on hot air and are at the whim of the prevailing winds to push them through the sky. The French were the first to successfully use balloons, both tethered and untethered, in the 1700s. Parachutes, on the other hand, require elevation to safely descend to earth, and evidence of early designs are found in illustrations by Renaissance Italians in the Quattrocento, most famously Leonardo da Vinci. Whether there were successful jumps during that period is up for debate. The modern parachute was invented in the late 18th century by Louis Bastion Lenormand in France, who made the first recorded public jump in 1783. Both balloons and parachutes would, of course, be developed, modified, and approved after their early successes, and not surprisingly, both were adopted for military purposes. In a minor bit of kismet, the first successful and consistent use of parachutes to escape a flying object was in World War I by artillery observers in tethered observation balloons. The use of parachutes in aircraft proved more problematic. Adapting parachutes for use in fixed-wing aircraft would be taken up first by the German military in World War I, with mixed results, but was good enough at least once to save a young German ace by the name of Hermann Goering. Because of the size of the aircraft of the time, particularly the fighters, the German system was like those used on the observation balloons. A harness would be attached to the pilot while the parachute was stowed on the fuselage. As the pilot egressed his airplane, a static line attached to the harness would pull the parachute free and hopefully deploy to float him to safety. The complication would be the disposition of the aircraft while the pilot was trying to bail out. Whereas the crew of an observation balloon would parachute from a perfectly good balloon at the first sight of an enemy aircraft, the fixed-wing pilot would possibly be jumping from a disabled spinning aircraft that quite often entangled the parachute shroud lines and would take the pilot with it. And, as unpredictable as the system was, it was better than what the Allies had. Nothing. 
Following the end of World War I, the development of the parachute and its use for pilots who escaped their disabled aircraft in the U.S. would be taken up by Major Edward L. Hoffman of the U.S. Army. The process would examine and bring together the best elements of various parachute designs. His team would include Leslie Irvin and James Floyd Smith who both had a personal stake in the outcome of the design process. Seventeen distinctive designs would be tested using test dummies. As the test progressed, results favored Floyd Smith's design, a design he would patent on July 27, 1918. With further improvements, it would eventually be known as the Airplane Parachute Type A that incorporated three key elements that wouldn't change much in the years to come. Those elements were one, the parachute would be contained in a soft pack and worn on the back. Two, there would be a ripcord that allowed the pilot to open the chute when they were safely away from the airplane, and three, a pilot chute that would pull the main chute from its pack. For his efforts in developing the airplane parachute Type A, Major Hoffman would be awarded the Robert J. Collier Trophy in 1926, an award that is presented to those who have made, and I quote, the greatest achievement in aeronautics in America with respect to improving the performance, efficiency, and safety of air vehicles, the value of which has been thoroughly demonstrated by actual use during the preceding year." Unquote. For Irvin, it would be the first Army Air Service order awarded for 300 parachutes. He was the lowest bidder. Smith, however, disputed Irvin's patent, won the suit, and he was compensated $3,500 to transfer his patent to Irvin. Both men continued to produce and supply parachutes to the Army Air Corps. The development and improvement of parachutes would continue following the development of the Type A, and the three basic precepts still dictating those advances. The location of the parachute on the pilot's body would be the most fluid of these precepts, with the services eventually settling on a harness system that had the pilot seated atop the parachute just before the outbreak of World War II, the B-3 and B-4 types. This was an appropriate arrangement for fighter pilots, but not well suited for bomber crews who needed to be free to move around their aircraft. This required the Army Air Corps to quickly revert to a backpack-style parachute, the A3 and A4 types. For a propeller-driven aircraft, these parachutes proved effective and continually life-saving, but with the ever-increasing speed and altitude of aircraft, particularly jets, there would be a need for a better system for the pilots to escape their wounded aircraft. The ejection seat would seem to be a modern invention, but like many assumptions, that would be wrong. The first ejection sheet test was conducted in 1910 using a dummy and a bungee cord for propulsion. Although there would be a continued interest in the development of the ejection seat before World War II, it would be the Germans beginning in 1938 who successfully developed an ejection seat system that was used during World War II. They developed three types, each with its own propulsion system, compressed gas, a spring-operated mechanism, and finally a propellant charge. Those systems would be used mostly in their jet aircraft, and so limited in use that only 60 successful ejections were made. Following the end of the war, it would be the British who would further develop and perfect the ejection seat. The Martin Baker Company was formed in 1934 as an aircraft manufacturer. Despite also working on early ejection seat designs, it wouldn't be until 1942 when Captain Valentine Baker died while testing the MB-3 that so affected James Martin that pilot safety became Martin Baker's primary focus. Their first seat, the Mark I, was first installed in the Saunders Row A-1, a jet-powered flying boat, in 1947. Once the Mark I seat ejected the pilot from his stricken craft, it still required the pilot to pull a ripcord. The Mark II was introduced in the early 50s and was an improvement over the Mark I by offering automatic seat separation and parachute deployment. The later Mark V seat became the first 00 seat, which meant the pilot could safely eject from an aircraft that wasn't in the air or moving. The Mark V was fitted into the Grumman F-11 F Tiger, while the Mark VII was modified to fit in the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. The Martin Baker Company claims 7,097 lives have been saved by their ejection seats. Fortunately, ejection 4,459 and 60 would save my dad and his Rio Tank Sherman. As for our lightning strikes, it would be Tommy Attridge, mentioned earlier, who would be the first Grumman test pilot to shoot himself down on a test flight. He accomplished this feat during a flight of the Grumman F-11F-1 Tiger on September 21, 1956, while testing the four internal 20mm cannon flying at Mach 1. 
This test was to assess the newly reconfigured link and cartridge ejection system. The earlier system had not gotten the spent links and cartridges far enough away from the aircraft, and they were scratching and denting the fuselage. On his first test flight that day, flying a similar flight profile to his later one, he returned safely to Calverton, although the aircraft had several dents to the plane that were assumed to be associated with the original problem. With the later outcome, that thinking would change, and the second flight that day would prove his undoing. In a shallow dive beginning at 22,000 feet, he went past Mach 1. Passing through 13,000 feet, he fired the 20mm cannon for a 4 second burst, waited for the guns to cool, and then fired a second burst. His prescribed profile ended at 7,000 feet, where he was struck by a minimum of three 20mm rounds. After a later examination of the Tiger, it was assumed one of those rounds ricocheted into the air intake and f would the engine. Attridge then did what many pilots do, and are often admonished for doing. Despite a very damaged engine, he tried to fly back to the airfield. Like the first F-14 to crash, he would be within sight of the airfield. He was within three quarters of a mile of the airfield when he lost power and settled into the tree, sliding 300 feet before the burning aircraft came to a halt. Unstrapping himself from his unused Martin Baker Mark V ejection seat, he was able to escape and recover from his wounds to return to flight status six months later. Strike one. Some of the details I'm about to share come from an article my dad wrote for Flight Journal concerning our second strike. I put a link in the notes below if you'd like to read it. Fifty years ago, on June 20th, 1973, before my brother, sister, and I were getting ready for our day, my dad was getting ready for his. He was avoiding eggs for breakfast, drinking some coffee, packing himself a lunch he tucked into his briefcase, folded himself into his white 240Z, drove down the Camarillo grade, and in a half an hour would arrive through the gates of the Naval Air Weapons Center at Point Magoo. Just like he did every workday, nothing special. It was a typical sunny day that would see the high temperatures reach 87 degrees, but there were no clues that something extraordinary was going to happen. It was just a Wednesday. School was out, and we were getting ready to fly back to the East Coast for the summer. Not sure what I was doing on this day, Maybe I'd been swimming in the pool, maybe reading my daily dose of science fiction, maybe listening to music, I don't know. But during all that, whatever that was, the phone rang. I lifted the receiver with its deluxe extra long cord and with the standard, hello, this is the purposes, I answered the call. Hi, this is Richard Withen, a reporter for the New York Times. Could you tell me how old your father was? Was? That didn't sound right. I quickly answered, he's 38 and hung up. This was my first clue that something had happened, but with communication as it was in the early 70s, I waited and wondered. Withen's article ran on page 8 of the June 22nd issue of the Times. Around 6 or 7 I heard the door open and in walked my mom and dad. My mom said, kids, your dad has something to tell you. My dad stepped out from behind my mom, still in his flight suit and still wet. Now, memories are tricky things because I don't know why he'd still be in his flight suit and even stranger still wet. But that's how I remember it. And I have no memory of what he told us, but I do know it went something like this. Arriving at the gate at Point Magoo on June 20th, 1973, my dad was waved through, and he proceeded on the well-worn path to his usual parking spot, a short distance from the offices provided Grumman for their part in the test program. After greeting several colleagues, he made a quick detour to the kitchenette to put his lunch in the fridge. He arrived at his desk at precisely 8 a.m. He was to meet with the flight team at noon to review his upcoming flight, so until then he tended to paperwork from the previous day, mostly reviewing his notes from his flight on Monday in number six that included two AIM-70 launches, one at 0.5 Mach 40,000 feet and 1G, the other at 0.7 Mach 20,000 feet and 1G, uneventful and as planned. Just before noon, a quick coffee refill in hand, my dad made his way to the meeting room. Bob Motti, F-14 number 6's test coordinator, was already there copying his ditto onto the chalkboard. Tom Riley, Grumman's lead separation engineer, was hunched over the table, rechecking his numbers, slide rule at the ready. After Bob and Tom reviewed the day's flight test procedures on the chalkboard, Tom handed my dad a stack of 5x7 cards that detailed each step of the test even further. Then it was Grumman's range coordinator, Jim Homer's turn to brief the crews on their boundaries of the test area and the array of test frequencies and range procedures for that day's flight. Finally, my dad and Tank briefed their chase plane pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Fritz Menning, USMC, flying an F-4 from the VX-4 Tactics Development Squadron, and photographer's mate one, Bill Irving, who would be filming the flight from the back seat of the chase plane. Leaving the meeting room, they made their way to the flight line. F-14 number 6 had already been pulled from the hangar, 
the dummy AIM-7E-2 Sparrow already loaded in the farthest aft station, number four. My dad and Tank made their way around the jet for the pre-flight, a routine they had done many times before, but just as critical now as it was the first time they performed this task. Then it was into the cockpit to go through the pre-flight checklist, spool up the engine, all systems go, radio the tower, and taxi to the end of runway 21. With an offshore breeze coming over their nose, they were cleared for takeoff and made their way directly to the test location, about 80 miles offshore between Santa Rosa and San Nicolas Islands. Having gone through many of his 5x7 note cards on his way to the test location, my dad found himself where he was supposed to be. 567 knots indicated airspeed, or 652 miles per hour, 5,000 feet, zero Gs, note cards safely stowed. With conviction, he pulled the trigger. With far less conviction, the AIM-70 Sparrow that had been lingering in the farthest aft station number four in the tunnel between the engine and the cells failed to get enough separation from the aerodynamic attraction of its mothership, whereupon it hit the underside of the F-14, gouging a fuel cell. My dad then watched as the missile tumbled end over end, shredding pieces, and immediately thought those pieces had FOD'd his left engine. The master caution light directed him to the caution advisory panel, where all the cautions were lit. But the most ominous was the bleed duck light that would usually lead to an engine fire. He tried to turn off the bleed air source. It proved to be in vain as the chase pilot told him that he had a good fire going. Sure enough, a quick look back at the instrument panel and the left engine fire warning light was lit. Reaching for the left fuel shutoff valve, the plane suddenly pitched up with a violence of 10 Gs from a probable burn through of the control rod that actuated nose down commands. He had lost control of the jet, and all that was left to do was eject. With his new mantra, eject tank eject, he found himself somersaulting through the air, not knowing who initiated the ejection sequence. The Martin Baker Mark 7 ejection seat had done its job in a fraction of a second. Hanging from his parachute in beautiful silence, a life raft dangling below him, he was able to watch the burning F-14 fly a lazy spiral into the sea 7,000 feet below. After reviewing his water survival tactics while hanging from the parachute canopy, he performed those duties with different levels of success after landing in the water, but most importantly found himself in the life raft, and he waited. In about 45 minutes, the rescue helicopter arrived to find my father and Tank floating aimlessly in the rafts. A swimmer dropped from the helicopter to convince a reluctant pilot, my dad, to exit the safety of his life raft, into the harness, and into the safety of the helicopter 20 or 30 feet above his head. Now cold and wet in the helicopter, he arrived 45 minutes later back at Point Magoo, cold and wet. The time elapsed from the missile launch to the ejection was 39 seconds. Before pulling the trigger, my dad was another highly skilled test pilot. Following his ejection, he would forever be introduced as the guy who shot himself down. What would only be known later, and to a few, was that in 39 seconds my father had changed. Pre- and post-ejection Pete were two different people. So, until next time when we investigate what that difference was, thanks for joining me for the 17th installment of The Dad Project. I continue to tell the stories I had hoped my father would tell me, and I appreciate you all being along for the journey. So please subscribe if you'd like to hear more. And until next time, thanks for watching, and enjoy what life has given you. Ciao.